Hello. Good evening. Bonsoir. Bonsoir. Je m'appelle Chris. Je vends des livres à Boswell. Et je parle un petit peu français. Uh, et mal. Um, donc, anglais. Welcome, everyone. My name is Chris. I'm a bookseller here at Boswell. For those of you who don't speak French, for those of you who do, you already know that. Um, now you all know that. And isn't that a wonderful thing? Uh, the first thing I want to do is thank all of our co-sponsors this evening. Of course, Alliance Francaise de Milwaukee, thank them. And Flora, a member, is going to be a representative here this evening. Um, I also want to thank the Holocaust Education Resource Center for co-sponsoring tonight and UWM Sam and, Hel Sam and Helen Stahl Center for Jewish Studies for co-sponsoring tonight. So thank you to all of them. You're all wonderful organizations. I can vouch for all of them. Um, as I said, in conversation with Flora Fuller, who's a French instructor at, at just French instructor extraordinaire, I should say, at the Alliance, uh, we're thrilled to welcome Anne Barris. Uh, she is co-author of How to Be Parisian Wherever You Are and author of uh, Sagan Paris 1954, a novel based on the life of French writer Francois Sagan, uh, among other works. Um, I also found out while doing research today, she and I have the same birthday. So how about that? Anyway, she's here tonight with the postcard or la carte postale. Uh, it's been a bestseller in France since it came out, one of the most acclaimed French novels in recent memory. Um, it's been racking up awards left and right, including the American Trois Goncourt Prize, our answer to France's Prix Goncourt, which, by the way, the postcard was also a finalist for. So please give them both a very warm welcome. Bonsoir. Bonsoir. <laughs> um, welcome to Boswell. Uh, my name is Flora. I've been a teacher at Alliance Francaise for about 10 years, um, maybe a little bit less. Um, and I'm in charge, in co charge with uh, one of my friends of the uh, Troc Livre, which is our book club uh, at Alliance Francaise. And that's been running since 2017. And um, we read books in French and only in French, but uh, we exchange books. So actually, uh, La Carte Postale has been um, a book we talked about already last year. Uh, one of our members was reading it and recommended it. And uh, we are very excited tonight to have Anne Berest with us. Um, so welcome. Um, Merci d'être là. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, I'm so impressed. You are a lot of people. <laughs> Wow, so thank you for coming. Um, on commence par des questions? Uh, yes, I, I just would like to um, apologize uh, for my English. Um, I haven't spoken English since several months, so I feel a bit um, hesitant. And that's, that's why I need my notes and to help me. Très bien. Um, no problem. And we will have, uh, we'll start with questions in English and then we'll have a time for questions in French as well. Um, and so um, we'll start with the first question, um, which is, um, can you tell us a little bit about how the book came to happen? Um, which is... Um, yes. <laughs> it was not the first question you sent me. <laughs> That's tricky. <laughs> oh, okay. I'm here. So, um, so first of all, I, I want you to know that the book is based on true facts and on events that happened to me and to my family. So it, it's everything uh, I wrote is uh, true. That's not imagination. So to, to make a long story short, um, the book starts in 2003 uh, when my, my mother um, receives a postcard in her letter box. And um, the postcard is very strange because uh, it's an anonymous postcard with only 
four first names written on it. Uh, four first names that my mother uh, recognized uh, recognizes immediately because uh, they are the first names of her grandparents, uncle and aunt. Um, she didn't uh, meet them because um, they died uh, during the war uh, in uh, uh, death camp. And so uh, they died uh, in 1942. And 60 years later, someone sends this postcard uh, and someone, someone who wanted to remain anonymous. So that's, that's the, the beginning of the story. Thank you. Uh, merci. Um, je vais continuer avec une question qui n'était pas euh, dans le bon ordre, mais c'est sur le même thème. Um, how long did it take uh, you from the moment your mother discovered the postcard in the mail and the moment you decided to write about it? Um, 15 years. Uh, 15 years between uh, the day uh, the postcard arrives uh, in our later box and 15 years later i decided to uh, start the investigation and what an investigation um <laughs> if you have read the book um you will see it in several parts the first part is um the story of anne's family um it's it's deep and researched uh, and there's lots of um, emotions uh, when you read it that come to you. The second part is the investigation itself. And uh, there are pretty interesting moments that I found. There was one moment that I found was funny. Um, and I think in French, it is funny when you read it in the book. In English, maybe it doesn't translate as well. Uh, the translation is great. It's, it's beautiful. But that part I thought was not exactly it because um, it's when you meet the, the private detective whose name is Frank Falk. Um, um, and um, you present him with the postcard and you tell him, you ask him what he can say about the postcard. And first he looks at the names and with his very strong accent from the Southwest, and I'm not really good at accents, but I can imagine it's like, Oh, mais elle est horrible votre histoire. Uh, and, um, uh, oh non, c'est vraiment terrible. Uh, and I don't know if it's the right accent, but the way you were explaining that nobody in the postcard could have sent it, and because they were gone for a long time, they died in a camp, um, killed by the Nazis. And you explain like little by little to make sure that he gets the point. And and then he just says something like that, which is like, you're not expecting that from a, a private detective. So um, my question is, was that exactly how it happened? <laughs> or, yeah? Yes, but in the book, I am alone um, with him. And in reality, I was with my mother because I said to my mother, uh, I want to investigate and we will go to uh, see a private detective. And she answered, my daughter, you are crazy. And I said, no, if you if your car is broken, you go to a garage and we have a, a investigation to do. So we, we, we go to see a private detective. And we we met that guy who was so funny and he said i'm sorry ladies um i i do uh, divorces um uh i can watch your neighbors uh if you have a problem with your boss but your postcard i i don't know i i can't do anything for you nothing for you so and um it was after uh the meeting with the private detective i remember i was with 
my my mother in a in a uh, coffee uh, uh, in front of the uh, office uh, in front of the agency, and I say to my mother, maybe I should write some notes. Maybe it could be a book. And it's weird because I'm a writer and that's my sixth book. And it took times, time between the moment I decided to uh, make the investigation and the moment I, I realized that it could be a book. And uh, uh, about the sense of humor, Yes, uh, it was very, very important uh, to me that the book had humor uh, because um, sense of humor is a, a typical of Jewish culture. And it was also a way to bring light into my book uh, because the book is quite dark and due to the subject and so i and i think that the entire section of the investigation with my mother is uh, quite uh, funny i i hope i believe and you know uh jewish humor uh, is about to find uh, laughter within tears and it's a way to defy death. Thank you. Yes. Um, well, <laughs> I don't know how to uh, rebound on that. <laughs> but um, yeah, um, I think the, um, there are lots of moments in the, in the investigation, especially when you are in the village as well. And um, you have to climb on top of the car and um, just just... Yes, we are with my mother like a very bad detective duo. <laughs> in, like in the movies. And we are always arguing and she's always smoking <laughs> in the car and I am sick. And I say to my mother, mom, I'm sick. And she she finds me boring because I... Uh, I'm sick in the in a car with cigarettes, and that's that. All these moments really happened, and it was funny to just write it. That's that's great. So that gets to my next question, which you say everything is true. Um, are there? Um, uh, it, it talks about your your memo your memoir in a, in a way. Uh, your memories, is it a family autobiography? Is it your autobiography? Is it, is there any fiction in this, um, in the book? I, I need my, my, my note because it's, it's, it's a difficult question. Um, so I, I usually say that it's a true novel uh, because everything is true, meaning that um, I haven't invented anything. The facts are true and I rely on archives and letters and researches and everything I, I say about my family is uh, documented, uh, including including addresses, journeys, quotes from text and letters. Um, all all these are my my raw my raw materials, um, and I will always wanted to stick uh, to reality uh, to tell things that happened. Um, and likewise, uh, everything related to the investigation is true. Uh, uh, for example, I really uh, consulted with a, a graphologist uh, who is uh, specializes in uh, 
the analysis of um, anonymous writings and um, this expert that I met, uh, his name is Je Jesus, li like the yeah. son of God. Jesus. Jesus. Like... Uh, so I couldn't have made it up because I don't have the imagination for that. And um, I, I worked closely with him and so I remember telling my mother, Mom, I spoke with Jesus today, and he thinks we are on the wrong way. And um, I really met um, my daughter's uh, school principal, and all the story of the postcard is true. So. Uh, why did I write novel on the book, um, on the cover? Uh, for many reasons. And the first reason is that I'm writing a book in a style of a novel. Uh, I, I, I give flesh to my characters and I make them live and I give them emotions, and I, I write dialogues. I, I was not there, so that's a novel. Even if I had letters and a lot of material to understand them. And um, so in the book, my investigation lasts four months, but in reality, it took me four years. And um, so I, I have condensed the time, which is a, a novelist uh, work. And um, if, I, if, if I had told the investigation exactly as it happened, so uh, the book would have been something like two, 2,000 pages long and and very boring. So um, um, so let, let me give you an, an example. So uh, when we, we go in the car with my mother to the village where my family uh, was arrested, um, we, we, we arrive one morning and we met uh, a first neighbor and then we met a second neighbor and then a third one and everything uh, goes um, fl uh, is fluent um, uh, and everything flows perfectly uh, and a counter leads to another counter uh, like a, a set of dominoes uh, but so in real life, all these encounters uh, really take place, but not the same day. And uh, uh, all these uh, moments uh, represent several years of uh, chronology. Um, so in other words, I am like a, a seamstress or like an... an embroider all all my beads are true but i i i i weave them and organize them uh in my in my way and um uh and i use uh, the tools of the novel to tell a story that holds together um the third reason um is that why the third reason it's novel on the cover is that um, I, I wanted uh, to change the names of people who uh, behaved badly during the war because I am not an historian. I am a writer, so I can do that. Um, and I changed the name of collaborators and French officers why? 
uh, because I thought of the grandchildren of these people and who are not responsible for the actions of their ancestors. Um, for example, uh, the later that uh, the mayor, mayor of the the, forge, the, the mayor, yeah, the mayor of the the village, uh, the later is true. I didn't change one word, but I changed the name of the mayor because I I thought that now he has grandchildren and. Uh, and the village is not called Les Forges in reality. Uh, in the other hand, I kept all the real names of everyone who helped my family. And the fighters, uh, the resistance members, the village school teacher who tried to save my family and who will be killed uh, in a trap, uh, the members of the network, the old lady who rented a house to hide my grandmother, because it's important to name uh, those who risk their lives. And it's a way of inscribing them in the great book of life. Well, thank you very much. Um, it's There are moments during that, um, uh, day where you are in Les Forges and one after the other you meet those families, those people and I was like there's no way so many emotions just for one afternoon or one one day because you take a break eating and I'm like how can they eat right now? No! <laughs> um, and and I've, it's a question for later but um, I wonder if you can take us to that moment um, when you meet Jean Faucher uh, or the person I think he's called Jean Faucher, who has the piano yeah. and the pictures. Yeah. And um, I don't know if you want to talk about that or if you feel like um, it. Uh, a lot of people ask me why I, I but it's, it's not easy to talk about it because I don't want to spoil to, that's true, that's to true. readers. <laughs> Let's not spoil it. No. Let's talk about something else. Um, I do have, um, I, I want to quote the book and I want to talk about your first um, Pesha, who I'm not sure how to pronounce it, Pesha. Pesha. Yes. Um, and this is when you are um, meeting Georges' friend um, for the first Pesha. Um, and you meet a, a person called Deborah, who's really not happy to see you there. Um, she is interested in your then boyfriend, I think. Um, and and there's a, a story about your daughter, of course, that she brings out that she brings out at the event, which is um, that um, your daughter came back to school or came back from school one day, and that's a very important part of the of the book. Um, and ask her grandma. Um, Grandma, are you Jewish? And uh, Grandma said yes. And um, I'm not quoting exactly. And yes, so she she asked my mother, Grandma, are you Jewish? And she answered yes. And my my daughter asked, Is Mom Jewish? And my mother said yes, because you know when you are a child of a Jewish woman, you were Jewish and. And my daughter says, so I am, am I Jewish? And my mother say, yes, but she thought my, my daughter had a face and she asked her what, what happened. And my daughter answered, people don't like Jewish Jews at school. And so um, this evening, my, my mother uh, called me and she, she explained what happened and she told me you have to go to school and you have to ask the teacher what happened but me I was totally shocked and I couldn't even ask to my daughter what tell me what happened and to, I, I went to, into my bed and I had a flash in my brain 
with a postcard. I didn't thought about it since 15 years. And psychoanalysis uh, says that it's an avoidance obstacle when your brain creates a problem because you don't want to, sell, to solve another problem. Obstacle avoidance. So I, I was so shocked. I didn't want to speak with my, to talk with my daughter about what happened at school. And that's why my brain creates, created this obsession about the postcard. <laughs> um, and the fact of not talking to your daughter right away brought issues with your friends and a bit with yes. your mom. Um, what I'm quoting is from that evening um, where you're meeting um, Georges' friend and, and Deborah. And Deborah. And um, you explain that what, what your daughter experienced at school, and you say you don't really want to make a fuss out of it, um, and you haven't really talked to your daughter about it yet. And uh, Deborah um, says, she says a lot of things, but she says, if you are truly Jewish, you wouldn't take it so lightly. And then everybody is surprised. Uh, what's that supposed to mean? And then she asks you, do you even mention, do you ever mention Judaism in your books? And you say, I didn't know what to say. My wits deserted me. It started, I started to babble something meaningless. And then Deborah looked at me straight in the eye and said, the truth, as far as I can tell, is that you're only Jewish when it suits you. So how do you react to that? <laughs> and... um. Well, I'll let you answer to that first. And, and... Uh, yes, it, it, it was not nice, but <laughs> it was true. And all the book is my quest and my journey um, to understand what does the word uh, Jewish uh, mean to me. And to be able uh, to say, I am Jew, I, I am Jewish. Uh, please, that, that's okay. I need my. <laughs> um, so um, the book is a quest um, for self no self knowledge, and for uh, the meaning of the word Jew uh, in my secular life. So I wanted to explore uh, the complexities of um, Jewish identity in a, in a modern world. So as I explained in the book, um, I never entered into a synagogue uh, until the age of 20, because I was raised uh, in a completely secular family. And for my grandmother, God was dead in the death camps. And so I knew I was Jewish, but I didn't know why. And I didn't know what this word uh, meant so much. And for me, this word was a mystery, and which almost scared me because it was synonymous with death and persecution. So in the book, I try to uh, provide what the word Jewish means in my life and what does it mean to be grandchild of survivors? What does it mean to belong to the third generation? And what does it mean to observe Jewish holidays without practicing the religion. Um, and maybe uh, um, I could answer with a very short answer, is which looks like a, 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 Jewish, a Jewish joke. Uh, perhaps that being Jewish means 
spending one's life wondering what does it mean to be Jewish. Um, so uh, thanks to uh, the book, now I am a, I'm able to say I am Jewish because, and I am e I'm able to, uh, to enter uh, a synagogue uh, without feeling like a stranger. And today, um, thanks to Georges, the guy I met in the book, who is now my, my husband and the father of my, my second daughter, uh, I, I observe the holidays and uh, my daughters attend uh, Talmud Torah school and they teach me to sing the songs and they learn uh, Hebrew. And it's, for me, it's not a, a return to religiosity because I'm not a believer in that sense, but I am happy to rediscover a culture that has been interrupted uh, because of the Holocaust. And I approach uh, this practice from a, a cultural perspective uh, rather than a religious one. Thank you. Okay, uh, you answered the follow-up questions already. So that's that's really good. Thank you very much. Um, I want to talk about uh, the way you write. Um, it's um, I have my quote in French and I forgot to look it up in English. Um, it was when um, you discover what Noemi was writing and how she was writing. Uh, you discover her um, yes, notebooks. but not not tell too much. Because I don't. I don't want to tell too much. Yes. No, I, I just want to say um, um, no. It's really not about the story. Um, itself but um when you discover how she writes you say i turned the page the notebook had uh -huh. several notes plans of chapters yes. um some redacted passages everything was mixed up i recognized the way a writer um works a writer who's looking for their word and um has to uh, write down uh, the thoughts um and tell some stories um my question now is how do you write <laughs> um i i write every day um i i need it um but this book was very special and it it it, it was the most difficult book uh, to write i had ever faced um, because I had to manage two timelines, present and past, and I have to weave together a tremendous number of characters. I I had to to write the story of my family spanning over five generations. And um, the detective story and and the autobiographical part of the book. So uh, I, I was conscious it may be too difficult for me. And um, I worked so hard, so hard uh, uh, to find something fluent and not to mention all the historical research. I I have read something like, more than 100 books about the war and all and watched all the documentaries and read all the the testimonies and um i had to cut uh, 250 pages from the book to make it flows and um i intentionally wrote the past part in present and the present part in past to blur to blur the, the lines and uh, I had to uh, attempt I don't know how many versions of the book and sometimes 
I felt like I would never make it and the book was too big for me. Um, you were talking about how you have to, you had to weave your family history. Talking about your family, um, this book you wrote, the research was made with your mom. Um, she was, she's a very important part of the book. She's a heroine <laughs> of the book. <laughs> yes, she is. <laughs> um, you have, um, well, did that, did writing the book um, change your relationship with your mom? I don't know if it's changed, but it was so, so great to do it with her because I couldn't have written it without her because she made all the researches. Uh, and that's why I thought she had to be the heroine because people have to know that she's the one. And but I knew that it it will be very difficult for her to read about herself. That's strange. Even if you are a heroine, uh, it's strange to to be described and to. So I thought she has to read every fifty pages to get used to become a character. And I told her, ma'am, you can change what you want. If you are not comfortable with something, you ask me and I change. And um, so she told me after the first reading, um, I I don't speak like that. And I was surprised because I really noted exactly what she said. And and so I I I said, "Okay, ma'am, what, what do you want me to change?" And she said, um four letter words. And she said, I never, I, she said, I never swears. I never swear. <laughs> yes. Um, yeah. Okay. Yes. But I, 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 I told her I will change what you want. So I said, okay, ma'am. And that's why it's novel written on the cover. <laughs> Very good. <laughs> I'm sure she appreciates. <laughs> um, in the past, you work with your sister. You do have a yes. sister who's also a writer. She's a, ri she's a very good writer. And she, um, uh, so her name is Claire. And you wrote together um, about another person of your family who appears in this book, which is, uh, who is uh, Gabrielle Buffet-Picabia. And um, I was wondering why, I mean, she does have a part uh, in the book as well, where you talk about the meaning of names. Um, it's a very interesting um, chapter. And um, did she want to partake in the inquest? In the, in the, in... Uh, no. Um, at first, I told her, I I'm going to write about um, our uh, Rabinovich family. Is that a problem for you? Uh, and she she said, no, not at all. I, uh, she was writing a book that comes out now in France. And she said, that's not my question. And I, I noticed that in the sibling, in a sibling, you always have one person who is in charge of the memory for the sibling. And I thought that this question was also her question, but no. And I understood, okay, it's it's my mission in this sibling to 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 do that work for the others. And she was very happy. Um, and yes, uh, but I wanted her to be in the book. And you have this part uh, with which is called. 
uh, the first names because um, we are sisters and like my grandmother and her sister, Noemi, who is on the, on the cover, that is Noemi. And she was 19 on this picture. Uh, it was uh, a few months before uh, she was uh, arrested and she's so beautiful and sh she looks like my sister. And that's so strange because the second first name of my sister is Noemi. And my second, uh, the, my second name is uh, Miriam, like my grandmother. So two sisters in two generations with the, the same uh, names. And uh, I wanted to ask in the book uh, to my sister, what does it mean for her to uh, to uh, bear the name, to have this name, and what does it mean in our relationship? To I am I have the name of the sister who is a, the sole survivor, and she had the name of the the sister who died, and and how what it creates. Uh, in our uh, relationship, and so that's that's uh, a work about um, uh, names in the family trees that I I made. Thank you. That that brings a couple more questions on just on that, <laughs> um, the importance of names. Um, you said um, that I forgot exactly how you said it, but the importance of names, um, the the name that you're given. Uh, when you're born and what it carries, oops, what it carries um, uh, throughout your life, and um, also what you get from your ancestors that was not resolved. Um, can you tell us a bit about that? Uh, yes. Um, um, when when I was uh, twenty five, uh, I. Uh, I was going through uh, like uh, a depression and I met uh, a therapist and she she was a family tree therapist. She worked with, you know him, Alessandro Jodorowsky. And um, the, the therapy, uh, you, I had to, um, to draw, um, my family tree on a large board and this woman could see on my family tree all the cycles all the repetition the repetitions of traumas uh, from generation to generation and it was very interesting and so uh, i i delved into uh, this uh, idea of um, um, what what I called invisible transmission. It's the transmissions in your family tree that are invisible, but that are real. And when you work, when you are working on your family tree, you will discover a lot of coincidences. But maybe that's not coincidences, and maybe that's invisible transmissions. It can be, for example, uh, uh, when when I was writing the book, I discovered that my grand uncle lived in the same street uh, where I live, and Paris is large, and I live in a tiny, tiny street. And it was crazy to think that it was in front of me. All these coincidences are, um, all, all people who are working on their family tree discover such coincidences. So invisible transmissions are very important and 
and I read a lot of articles about um, the cellular memory. I don't know if I pronounce it. Yeah, that's, well. that's uh, So it means that our cells have a, a, mem a memory of emotions uh, from uh, three generations. And I loved this idea because it means that we we live with our ancestors, even if we don't know who they were, but they are living in, in us. And so that's one of the main theme of the book. Thank you. Um, do I have time for one more question or should I one more? Okay. Um, at the beginning, when I started reading the book, and uh, well, no, I, I had read the book. When I started, when I knew I was going to ask you some questions, um, I was going to ask you about um, after all that your family has gone through uh, in the past, uh, in the more recent, we were more recent times, um, what you thought about um, the, the um, how anti Semitism is in France right now. And then um, the current events happened um with um with the, the war with the war and so can you tell us a bit about your um, thoughts on uh it's it, it's it's difficult uh for me to express myself about um the situation and the war in israel i am like all of us are deeply shocked um, by what is happening. I have family there and, and friends, and I imagine you do as well. So uh, we live every minute in fear. But what is unique in France is that the Israeli-Palestinian conflict resonates uh, with our society. And so that's we have we we have uh, rumors of attacks and all the all the Jewish schools are closed and when you are in the subway you can feel the fear of people. France is France is really. Uh, 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 upset uh, by by the war, and um, there's been a lot of um, anti-Semitism acts in France as well. Um, yes, after that, yes, happened. Yes. Um, questions. The audience questions, not comments. If you're if your sentence doesn't end, your voice kind of going up. <laughs> <laughs> this is not going up. <laughs> what? Okay. What are you working on next? Um, my father told me. Why are you always writing on your farm, a mother's family? And so I'm working on um, my father. And, and uh, so I had no choice. <laughs> and I, I, we will see. It's, it's, it's exactly um, before this book, this novel, I wrote a book with my sister about our great-grandmother at the beginning of the century and about uh, the how uh, about artists i try that's 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 my my work i i take a a, a, a person in my family and i try to describe a moment of my country uh, through uh, this character so with my father uh, I work on um, the 70s 
my parents were um, Gushist, uh left. Yeah, they were like um, yes, leftist. 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 My my father, my father was a trust Trotskyist. Yes, that's a, a a word I always heard in my life, but I I didn't know what what that. So now I know everything about Trotsky, Trotsky, Lenin, difference between Maoist and Trotskyist. <laughs> Uh, so it's it's May uh, 68 in France and the revolution and my mother was a, a feminist and so it will be funny and and how they met my mother was older my father was like a, a nerd uh, a mathemat all, all, only obsessed by revolution and mathematics so i hope it will be funny okay. um how i became a writer you have the answer on the book and i don't want to spoil it but I, uh, during my investigation, I made a discovery so strange. And I understood why my sister and I became writers and why it has to do with the invisible transmission. Uh, my favorite writers, there are so many so many so if you agree i i will answer with living authors um of course annie erno the nobel prize M my i my mother had uh her books when i was a teenager so i started to read annie erno since i was a teenager and uh it's really important she's so important uh in my life and for the for the book uh i i could say that patrick modiano another uh, nobel french nobel prize patrick modiano is so important uh i met him and he's he's yes he's very important and she's no she's not alive she's but Irene Nemirovsky uh, is very important for me and the book. Uh, I, I, I told about her in the book and after I met her grand-grandchildren and we became friends. And so Annie Arnaud, Irene Nemirovsky and Patrick Modiano for the book. Thank you. Uh, la réception du livre en France? Ah. Um, so, uh, one month uh, before my book uh, came out, my mother told me, I have to speak with you. Come on in the garden, I need to smoke a cigarette. I I understood it was serious. And she told me, okay, you have to know that people are fed up with us in France and that they didn't want to hear about Holocaust anymore and too much books, too much stories, so if you don't uh, sell your book, it's not because it's a bad one. It's because uh, people don't want to to hear that story anymore. So I I I I cried 
I said, mom, my book comes out in one month and that's horrible to save me that. Uh, so the book was a success, a big success in France and it was a huge surprise at first for my publisher. Uh, and I think that uh, the fact that I wanted to explain exactly uh, step after step what happened during the occupation, and it was maybe, uh, I don't know, important for people to, to I don't know, we, it's always a mystery. When a book is a when a book is a success, you don't know why. And um, and I receive so many letters uh, each week, and um, so that's that's a, a miracle. And um, and so it's. A, Maybe it's important because uh, now um, the witnesses in France and the survivors are very, very old or they are dying. And we know uh, the third generation that our children will live in a world without uh, witnesses and a world without witnesses is a dangerous word. And because um, nobody uh, will be able to, to say, I was there, that's what I saw. And you can't tell, you can't say it doesn't, it didn't exist. So maybe we are in that moment of transition between the world with witnesses and the world without the witnesses. And maybe that's why we, we all feel something like uh, an urgency to um, this duty of transmission. Thank you very much.